Well, I, I think there are many people who are familiar with Mike who are here in this class and then some who are not. So um, I'll continue to let folks in as they come, but I want to honor all of our time um, and welcome, welcome you to this six session uh, experience with Mike Hollander. We're really excited um, about this opportunity to engage together um, with Mike, who is literally in Israel um, <laughs> and uh, is a renowned educator. Um, many of us have had the privilege of traveling with Mike in Israel or in other places um, across our globe. And Mike has been here to North Shore Congregation Israel on many times as many occasions as a speaker and a teacher. Uh, and we are uh, really lucky and delighted to be able to learn with you, Mike. So um, friends who are joining us, just a, a sense of how this will work. Um, Mike's going to speak initially, and then um, toward the end, hopefully there'll be time for questions and answers. Um, if we run out of time, we'll open uh, the next time. We'll try, to, we'll try to have the opportunity to make sure everyone has the chance to ask and answer questions. Um, you can use the chat feature, but there's no promises that we're gonna get to that or not. So um, just something to keep in mind. Am I forgetting anything, Mike? No, Great. so far so good. So my only recommendation uh, for those who are here in uh, the course is, is if you put your view onto speaker view, it will make the person who's speaking the center most point of your screen and easy to see. Um, and and uh, we'll be able to direct our attention to Mike that way. So with no further ado, Mike Hollander, Ruchim Habaim, welcome to our Zoom space. Thank you, Rabbi. Nice to see some familiar faces or at least familiar names. Um, I should say that I am from Canada originally, for those who don't know me, so that's why I speak with a funny accent. So I, if I say out and about, you can laugh at me, um, but that's it. Please, no other laughter. I talk really quickly. I apologize in advance for that. Um, and we are going to do six sessions, which I came up with uh, in the summer, actually, starting with the beginning of Zionism and ending in 2000. Well, actually, when I put it together, I ended in 2021. So I've got another five weeks if I need to add anything that's happened in the past two or three months, which I'm sure something will happen here in the next five weeks. So welcome to Israel. I'm sorry that you guys can't be here. I uh, have a deep relationship with Chicago and many missions through many synagogues and JUF missions for, I want to say the first Chicago mission I had, and you might remember this one, Beth, I think was in the, uh, was your centennial mission in 1996 or 1998 with 22 buses. So if any of you were on that mission, I was one of the educators on the three bus Tanakh track with Rabbi Popko. So that's how long I've been working with Chicago. What I want to do now is take you on this virtual journey uh, it's mostly going to be a lecture, and I'll save some time for questions and answers at the end. But as Rabbi Wendy already said, we're going to have time over the next few weeks. And having done this already with a couple communities, what I like about it is that we can engage in a conversation over the month and a half that we're going to do these presentations. So I'm starting with Theodore Herzl, of course, on the right-hand side, with Kibbutz de Ganya, the beginnings of the socialist Zionist movement in the early 20th century on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. That's how it looked 110 years ago. And this is how Tel Aviv looks today. And actually, I can almost tell you, you see these towers? This is pretty funny. Um, I should tell you, I married, uh, my wife Michelle is from New York. We have three adult kids. Our youngest, 23, just finished four years in the Air Force and flew to Peru on Sunday. That's what Israeli kids do after the army. Our middle daughter is studying education up north and our uh, eldest son, who turns 29 today, and lives in one of these two apartment buildings in Tel Aviv. Um, it's an old picture because they're building the third tower there, these 48 story towers inside of Tel Aviv. So having made Aliyah from Canada and my wife, Michelle, from America, three Sabra kids, and in many ways, the Jewish state and, and the Jewish story is part of who I am. And that's the reason that I made Aliyah 33 years ago. I want to start today with this idea of Zionism leading up to 1948, which I've called from a from prayer to political movement to independence. We're all familiar with Theodore Herzl, of course. Many people might say the founder of Zionism. I might challenge that. I would probably say the founder of political Zionism. And I'm going to end today with the announcement of the birth of Israel on the 14th of May. When did Zionism begin? Look, there are a bunch of committed Jews. 
uh, in this conversation. We might not all be Jewish, I, I shouldn't assume that, but we're a bunch of committed people because you're here for the session, obviously you are committed. The question I will ask is a question that we'll all have different answers to. So one could possibly argue that Zionism begins in Basel with Herzl in 1897, where he said in his diary at the end of the Congress in Basel, Switzerland, I founded the Jewish state. Most of us would probably say that, but perhaps we should go a little bit further back in time to the uh, longing of our ancestors when we were slaves in Egypt, which we recount every Passover Seder to return to the land of Canaan over 3000 years ago, or maybe the longing of our ancestors in Babylon to return to Judea after the Babylonian destruction in 586 BC, or maybe the longing of our ancestors to return to Judea after the Romans destroyed Judea in 70 of the common era. Or perhaps we should look to the medieval period where the center of the Jewish world was in Spain. And Yehuda Levi, the great poet, wrote that beautiful poem saying, I, although I am in the West in Spain, my heart is in the East, right? I want to return to Zion, the land of Israel. Every year at the Pesach Seder, we say, and, and liturgically, we say in the prayers often, next year in Jerusalem, B'Shanah HaBab Yerushalayim. I'm going to look at the precursors of Zionism in the late, in the mid kind of to late 19th century, and I'm going to, as I say, end in 1948. Um, and I'm also going to take just a few slides at the beginning to go back to the uh, beginning of this idea of nationalism, which in many ways was a response, the minority response, to what I refer to as the one-two punch of enlightenment and emancipation. Processes in the late 1800s, 18th century, early 19th century in Europe, during which Jews engaged intellectually in conversations with the larger European society. We were emancipated, given equal rights across Europe, starting really in the late 18th and early 19th century. So when does Zionism begin? I can guarantee you there are, what, 20 of us on this call now. I don't think we'd all necessarily agree, but I'm going to say that I'm talking today largely about political Zionism. But as I said, should we go back to ancient Jewish memory by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat and we wept as we remembered Zion? Zion, another name for Jerusalem, of course, or another name for Judea or Canaan, the land of Israel. 2,600 years ago, we sung this. And we still say this, by the way, when we enter under the chuppah and we get married, right? I hear that all the time in the weddings here, and, and I'm sure in Chicago as well. Sing the song of Zion. How can we sing a song of Zion? We're in exile. Yes, there's lots of water in Babylon, but we want to go back to our ancient land. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, etc. Let my tongue sting to, cling to the roof of my mouth. I would argue that the first time that we actually know written that our ancestors long to return to the word Zion, not Knaan, the land of Israel, is about 2,600 years ago. And by the way, um, Western culture has adopted this because if you look on the B-side of American Pie, that great album by Don McLean, the second song, the first song in the B-side is a song that is called By the Rivers of Babylon, which is this quote from Psalm 137, or maybe Boney M and their version of By the I'm not going to sing. Anyway, that's for another time. Um, Beyond the Psalms, there were precursors. Already in the late second half of the 19th century, the most, the first was a guy named Moses Hess. And again, I, I will apologize in advance. Don't read all the text. You'll get lost. When I read, I'm going to put the, my highlighter on the reading. It's usually the yellow highlighted parts. Moses Hess, born in Germany, a, a contemporary with a guy named Karl Marx. We've all heard of Marx, of course, the grandson of a rabbi from Trier, in, uh, in, in Western Germany, and he writes, he works with him together on the Communist Manifesto, but shortly thereafter, he moves to Paris and he writes a book in 1862 called Rome in Jerusalem. And in that, he didn't leave his socialist roots, but he argued that the Jewish nation should have a socialist, uh, a socialist, uh, should, should be socialist. In other words, unlike universal socialism or Marxism of Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, Hess argued that we Jews had a unique contribution to all of humanity and that nationalism and socialism were to be fused together, very much different from international Marxist slash socialist ideology of Marx and Engel. And he writes, we have lived and labored among the nations for almost 2000 years, but nonetheless, they cannot become rooted organically within them. He already knew in 1862 that in spite of this attempt 
as he worked with Marx, to try to universalize all of humanity, the Jews were still seen as outsiders. We cannot become organically rooted within them. So yes, support socialism and equality, but in a particular Jewish milieu, and that would be in the Jewish state. The thought of my nationality, which is inseparable, connected with my heritage, with the Holy Land and the Eternal City, the birthplace of belief in the divine unity, etc., etc., etc. Oh, and for the hope for the ultimate brotherhood of all men. In other words, there was something unique in particular about the Jewish experience that Hess was promoting in this book in 1862. Unfortunately, Theodor Herzl never heard of this book. Otherwise, in 1896, when he writes the Zionist idea, when he writes the Jewish state, maybe he would have written it a little bit different or just republished Hess's book and put a new introduction. Here's an original from Germany in 1862, and there is his grave in the Kinneret Cemetery, there's the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret in the background, and it says in Hebrew, Moses Hess, he died in Europe and his remains were brought in the early years in the 1960s, I think it says down here, and it says the author of Rome and Jerusalem, 1862, and then it says in Hebrew, from the founders of world socialism and a heralder of the Jewish state. Now, when we look today, for example, at this tension that we see in the world, between the universalists and the particular. So nationalism is a bad thing. Zionism is a bad thing. There are many voices in, in the Western world who are saying this, that, you know, John Lennon said this and imagine there were no more nations. Well, we have a particular contribution, as all nations have a particular contribution. And Hess realized this, yes, support equality on an economic level all over the world, but we deserved our own particular piece of land. Where? In the land of Israel. But in Palestine at that time, it was quite desolate. And the most famous American to visit in the 19th century was a guy named Samuel Clemens. You've all heard of him. And before he wrote Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, he wrote a book called The Innocents Abroad. And it was journey, his journey with his church group all over Europe and the Grand Tour in the Middle East. And he comes to Palestine. You can see him. Where's the picture? There he is on the boat with this little quote from this postcard. Be good and you will be lonesome. That's not my advice. That's Samuel Clemens advice. And there you can see his passport from with his visa from uh, Istanbul from the Sultan over there, Constantinople. And he writes in the book the following 1869. He wasn't taken by the splendor, the splendor of the land. He wrote irreverently. He said the Sea of Galilee, and I quote, was a solemn, sailless, tintless lake as unpoetical as any bathtub on earth. Now contrast that with what the Zionists in the early 20th century thought about the beautiful lush Sea of Galilee. He continues, of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. Can the curse of the deity be, be beautify a land? Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes, etc., etc. In other words, Mark Twain giving us a beautiful literary cynical, to say the least, perspective of what was going on seven years after Moses Hess writes this. Where are the Jews at this time? There are the amazing ideas flourishing across Europe, liberalism and the failed revolutions in the, 18, in the mid 19th century, the idea of we the people, and as Americans, you can appreciate this, your constitution, right, begins with, or your declaration of independence, as again, we the people, the French Revolution in 1789, right, the people are sovereign, no longer the monarchs, the kings and queens of Europe sovereign, but the sovereignty with the nation. And the challenge was where the Jews fit in amongst these nations of Europe. And so there already was this idea of if everybody has their unique nation and we're kind of still seen as outsiders, maybe we too deserve our own nation. And with this plethora of ideologies flourishing in Europe and Jews engaged in this intellectual conversation, this really was the moment for the beginning of Zionism. But Again, before Herzl's 1897 Congress, there already was a movement, two movements, one called the Bilu. Here's their foundational document. It says, Beit Yaakov lechu v'nelcha, the house of Jacob, let us go up. It's a quote from Isaiah. And there were 14 university students from Kharkov in the Ukraine, which if I remember is your, Kiev is the Chicago sister city. Beth is going to nod her head on this one, right? together with Kiryat Gat, that's how well I know Chicago. They come and they settle in Palestine, 1882, and a little community called Mikveh Israel outside of Jaffa, it's an agricultural school. And then they establish a city called Rishon Lezion. Today, it's a city of a quarter million people just outside of Tel Aviv. Two or three years later, another group, the Lovers of Zion, Chovevei Zion, from Romania and the Pale of Settlement, which is what we would call today Latvia, uh, Lithuania, much of eastern, central and eastern Poland, Belarusia, a lot of Ukraine, where most of our grandparents or parents probably come from. 
and they come in 1884 and they join those other members in the city of Bilo. So small group of people, mostly religious, not socialist, right, but coming to establish these, these farming villages. By 1903, there are about 35,000 Jews who immigrate from Eastern Europe to Palestine, and many of the towns that you know of, in addition to Rishon Etzion, but Rosh Pina and the Galilee, Rehovot, close to where I sit to you now, near, near me in Modin, Petach Tikva, all established in the early 1880s, and eventually supported by the French Rothschild family. Now, what's amazing about all of this is what's happening in the Jewish world in North America. After the assassination of Alexander II in 1881 and the draconian May laws by his heir, Alexander III in Tsarist Russia, there is a massive exodus of Jews from the Pale of Settlement, right? Baltic Sea in the north to Black Sea in the south. About two and a half million Jews flee that area and settle in mostly North America. Two and a half million Jews go there, whereas 35,000 Jews move to Palestine by 1903. 1904 to 1914, you'll soon see a second wave. Altogether, 70,000 Jews settled in Palestine and two and a quarter, two and a half million Jews settled in North America. Just in terms of the numbers, to give you a sense of how I said at the beginning, Zionism was the minority response of modernity posed to the Jews in Europe in the late 19th century. So we've got these two organizations. One of the founders of the second organization was Leon Pinsker, um, who writes a book in 1882 called Auto Emancipation. Literally, I got an email two hours ago from a Jewish educational website that says, what are we celebrating this week? The publication on January 1st, 1882, 140 years ago, literally yeah, three days ago, of this book called Auto Emancipation. He, born in Poland, thought that the Tsarist regime, Alexander II, would liberalize and everybody would be equal. But ultimately, the wave of pogroms I mentioned, set off by the murder of the assassination of Alexander II, shocked him out of this notion. He studied law and medicine in Moscow and then eventually moved to Odessa. He writes this, this book that we have to auto-emancipate ourselves. It's not enough that the European countries have emancipated us and given us equal status within their countries, but we have to go another step and we have to create our own homeland. We are not a living nation, he wrote. There are everywhere aliens, therefore they are despised, us, of course. The creation of a Jewish nationality, of a people living upon its own soil, the auto-emancipation of the Jews, their emancipation is a nation among nations by the acquisition of a home of their own. So we've got 1862. We've got one book written already, Roman Jerusalem, Moses Hess. 20 years later, we've got Pinsker writing this other book, which is basically saying the same thing. But here he's saying specifically again, in the land of Israel. Here we've got a nice little picture of the first conference of these lovers of Zion. 32 delegates, this is Mr. Pinsker on the left-hand side. And there you can see him in the middle. You might notice that almost everybody in this picture is wearing a head covering. They're Orthodox Jews, mostly. The first wave of Aliyah, 1880 to 1903, um, these people, all right, there we go, um, this group of people were not, were mostly religious, not fully socialist, but definitely religious. And the challenge that they had in the first communities that they came here was, how does one relate to Jewish tradition in the land of Israel? For example, this year we're, we're uh, commemorating Shemitah, the seventh year in which all agriculture is supposed to lay fallow. How do you deal with that in the land of Israel? So we've got people coming. They don't have any experience in agriculture. They're helped out by Baron Rothschild, as I mentioned. By 1904, probably about eight or 10 of these small little communities. But they're coming from Romania. They're coming from Tsarist Russia. How do they communicate? Turns out that on January 7th, 1858, this man, which is two days from now, this is the second thing that I got in the email today. This man, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, is born in Lithuania. And he has this crazy idea, crazy idea. He moves to Palestine in 1881. He's all of 23, 24. And he says, this people has unlimited potential. It will therefore not be beyond the power of this people again as once before in the days of King Cyrus, King Cyrus, press pause, the Persian who allows the Jews to come back to Judea um, 2,600 years ago, right? Babylonians destroy the first temple, 
were in exile in, in, in Babylon. The Persian Empire takes over from the uh, Babylonians, and Cyrus has this vision speaking to our God and says, go back to the land, your homeland, and build the temple to God, and pay me taxes, by the way. And we'll come back to Cyrus at the end today. Um, in the middle of awakening to life, even after its death, and to revive the language that died with it, he then later wrote, he later wrote, the Hebrew language can live only if we revive the nation and return it to the fatherland. A brilliant idea. And in the modern era, when we speak about, on the one hand, this tension between universalism and nationalism or particularism, and there's a lot of accusation that Zionism is, uh, is the discriminatory national movement because it comes at the expense of someone else. But on the other hand, there's the celebration of indigenous culture all across the world at the same time too. So there's somewhat of a bit of a disconnect, but that's for another conversation maybe. Hebrew is really the only language that was an ancient language that was revived in the late 19th century, largely because of this crazy, literally crazy utopian idealist named Ben Yehuda, who said, we need to have a common language. And when the Hebrew University opened, here's a painting of the opening in 1925, or sorry, laying of the cornerstone in 1925, no, the opening of 1925, Chaim Nachman Bialik, our national poet, who was in Odessa, like many of the early Zionist leaders and moves to Palestine, says the following, let us all realize that this moment Israel has kindled upon Mount Scopus in Jerusalem, the first candle of the renaissance of her intellectual life. Oftentimes we hear, that Zionism is nothing more, or the Jewish state in Israel, is nothing more than a Western colonialist attempt to try to usurp someone else's land. But ultimately, Ben Yehuda and all of these ideologues in the late 19th century were reconnecting to that same land that we've been connected to for thousands and thousands of years. And the intellectual renaissance is an important part of the success of the Zionist movement, which you'll see not just later today, but in the following weeks that you are with me. Um, Theodore Herzl, most of us are familiar with Herzl, and some people would say, Mike, I don't understand, you're already 20 minutes into this, why didn't you begin with Herzl? We all know that Herzl, I mean, sorry, Where's, there he is, I mean, <laughs> he's there on my desk looking out as he looked in Basel in 1896, at the, 1897, at the first Zionist Congress. So without going into too much of Theodore Herzl, a Budapest-born journalist sent to Paris in 1894 to, uh, as a correspondent for the Viennese newspaper, who has his first notion that he could no longer just be an equal, on equal footing with other intellectuals in Europe, but there was xenophobia and chauvinism, and as he wrote, this unholy alliance between politicians, churchmen, and generals. And when this innocent man, captain, a, a, a Jew, part of the general staff, was accused of treason, because 100 years before, we were allowed to be equal and we're allowed to serve in the army. And then fast forward, there's all this internal balagan, as we say in Hebrew, chaos within France and tension. What direction should France be going in? How do we trust these others amongst us? There weren't massive North African immigration into Paris at the time, but there were Jews. And so the streets of Paris were filled with cries of death to the Jews. And Herzl realized at this moment that religious tolerance in France the place where the rights of man were written earlier, you know, less than 100 years beforehand, that it was impossible anyway. There was going to be anti-Semitism wherever Jews were. And so he writes this book, The Jewish State. There it is, the original. A uh, friend of mine in Toronto is a collector of everything connected to Theodore Herzl. And he um, sent me, he has an original piece of Herzl's, uh, one of Herzl's, uh, uh, the first printing edition, I should say, of the Jewish state. He writes this in 1896. It wasn't a bestseller, by the way. And he writes a lot, but I'll quote one little line. We have honestly tried everywhere to merge ourselves in the social life of the surrounding communities and to preserve the faith of our fathers. We are not permitted to do so. This has been demonstrated during 2000 years of appalling suffering. This idea that as much as we are emancipated and able to be part of the larger society were still seen as outsiders. You see from 1896 in the Jewish Chronicle, the British Jewish newspaper, January 1896, this is his book, Dr. Herzl, but we can do nothing without the enthusiasm of our nation and so be it. It is the poor and the simple who do not know what power man already exercise over the force of nature, etc. For we, for these have never lost the hope of the promised land. That notion 
of continued Jewish hope to return to the promised land was what Herzl was talking about, together with this idea of providing a safe haven for the Jews who were uh, being persecuted across Europe. When he has this book, um, he wants to have this first Zionist Congress with representatives from across Europe. He wants to have it in Germany. But the rabbis in Munich don't want it in their backyard because it would raise the possibility of questioning Jewish loyalty and patriotism to Germany and maybe double loyalty. And so he went to Basel, Switzerland, where there's a small Jewish community, which even had a kosher restaurant, by the way. And he rents out the casino and there he has the Congress. And at the end of the Congress, he writes quietly in his diary. In Basel, I founded the Jewish state. Were I to say this out loud today, I would be greeted by universal laughter. Perhaps within five, certainly 50 years, everyone will perceive it. Amazing prescience of mind because 50 years later in 1947 is when the United Nations voted to recommend creating a Jewish and a Palestinian state, by the way, but it was 50 years almost to the day of Herzl's prediction. 200 delegates from across Europe, even from America. What was amazing is that women, this is in the late 19th century, were given the right to vote already by 1898. In America, it took another 20 years, I think, 1918, if I'm not mistaken, the suffrage movement finally got women to vote. Already from the beginning, the Zionist movement, which was made up of delegates from different political parties, which created, we call today the WZO, the World Zionist Organization. There you go. A lot of ideological parties, religious Zionists, socialist Zionists, liberal Zionists, cultural Zionists, you name it, were all part of this organization, which is still there today, by the way, in what we call the Jewish Agency for Israel, which many of you, and if not Beth, can have a whole session on this a little bit later on. But it was the kind of shadow government of the future Jewish state, which, as I said, is still there. The shadow government, even though the state is still here, and there's a lot, lot of conversations over the nature of that relationship. Perhaps the most important, and maybe I'm putting out my colors here, I did grow up in a socialist Zionist youth movement, but the way I read it, perhaps the most important um, stream within Zionism was labor Zionism. This idea, as Moses Hess said, of fusing socialism and nationalism. And one of the great ideologues was a man named Nachman Sirkin. There is dates born in Belarus, educated in Minsk. I know most of you probably have parents or grandparents who came from somewhere between Minsk and Pinsk. He then goes to Berlin, this great intellectual center. And remember, coming from Minsk in the late 19th century, that's in Tsarist Russia. There's a lot of repression and, and oppression there. He goes to Berlin, which is really this very liberal, very open-minded place. He meets other Russian Jewish students who came to the West because they weren't even allowed in, or there were quotas in Russian or in Tsarist Russia University. Lots and lots of debates. Imagine, you know, lots of cigarettes, lots of coffee late at night. He came to the first Zionist Congress, and then he writes his book, The Jewish Problem and the Socialist Jewish State, a year later, two years after Herzl. He died in the 20s and also was buried, you'll see his grave, in the Kinneret Cemetery on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's interesting because all these precursors of Zionism were buried not in the National Cemetery in Mount Herzl, but rather on the cemetery next to the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he says, he writes, the Jewish state can come about only if it is socialist. Only by fusing with socialism can Zionism become the ideal of the whole Jewish people, of the proletariat, of the middle class, of the intelligentsia, etc., etc. The middle, the messianic hope will be transformed into political action. The Jews, he continued, have been presented with the opportunity to be the first to realize the socialist vision. This is a unique historical mission. Now, I'm not suggesting that the state of Israel today is socialist, but I am suggesting that the founding political organizations of the Zionists who came pre-state were largely socialist. And that really, there was a socialist political hegemony under the Labour Party until the 1977 election, and you'll see that in the coming weeks as well. Here is Sirkin, here he is on the right-hand side, serious fellow, he too would be, and there is his grave, and on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side it says here, he was the, the awakener, as it were, of socialist Zionism. And you can go, one of my favorite places in, in the country actually, is the Kinneret Cemetery, because a lot of these ideologues who never lived here, who died in Europe, but ultimately their remains were brought over here, herald in this notion of uh, the particular and the universal fusing together within socialist Zionism. A fourth or a fifth, I've lost count now, of ideologues is a man named Ber Borochov, 
who spoke, who was, who was very much in the Socialist Zionist Workers Union. He helped form the Workers of Zion, Paul Etzion Party, and he moves um, to, he, he goes back to Russia, he dies in Kiev, and ultimately he's buried again in the 60s at the same cemetery. He was this Marxist who espoused this Marxian uh, notion of dialectical materialism, but he said that political territorial autonomy in Palestine is the ultimate aim of Zionism for proletarian Zionists, etc. Without going too much into socialist, Marxist, ideological tenets, the notion of most of these founders, ideological founders, was that the, the Jewish state had to be socialist. And as I said, that was the majority overview for the first really, 60, 70 years or so. Um, and interesting, he talks about here, when other obstacles are removed, there will be sufficient land to accommodate both the Jews and Arabs. Normal relations between Jews and Arabs must and will prevail. Again, separate countries, maybe, in the future. But this notion that there was a recognition that there were also other people in the land at that time. There's Ber Borachov, um, without going more into his time. And it says here, He's one of the, uh, the, the founders of the foundation, or the creators of the foundation of working Zionism, a socialist Zionism. And it says, the Kovea Mishnata. So the Mishnah, we all know, the oral law. And he was the one who kind of um, established the laws, or the rules. And he was um, one of the kind of premier ideological precursors of this, the Jewish state. Anyway. All of this sets the ground for the second wave of immigration. 1880, we had the first wave of mostly religious Jews going to found Rishon Lutzion, Zichon Yaakov, etc. Wave, the second wave, heavily influenced by the socialist currents in Europe. They wanted a few socialism and Zionism, their founding fathers we already met. And it's at this time that a number of major institutions are established. The JNF, we all know, established by the WZO to buy and develop land for the new waves of immigrants coming. The first Hebrew Teachers Federation was established in Zichon in 1903. What greater proof of success of this crazy visionary of Eliezer ben Yehuda of people speaking a common language by having a teachers union in Hebrew? Unlike the Chicago, they would actually teach. And that's sorry, that's a local issue you guys are having right now. But they didn't have Corona back in 1903. The Zionist organization builds a training farm for newcomers who come across from Eastern Europe. And there they eventually form the intimate community, the Kfutsa, which becomes a kibbutz, which becomes the Moshav, the foundation agricultural settlements in the land of Israel. Other projects, such as the Hamashbir, the national, uh, it becomes a national kind of a soup, um, department store, Tnuva, the biggest dairy, the big building company, Solel Bone, which built the Entebbe Airport, by the way, helped us later in 76. The first bank, Apolim, the workers' bank, Kupat Cholim, the first HMO in 1911, the Haganah in 1920, a precursor to the Israel Defense Forces, and the Histadrut Labor Organization, uh, equivalent of AFL CIO. There's also an art school established in 1906 in Jerusalem, a new city called Achuzat Bayit, which becomes Tel Aviv in 1906. Self-defense organizations I already talked about. The Karen Ayasod, the overseas fundraising branch of the Zionist movement is established. And finally, the Jewish agency is the operational arm of the WZO. There's a lot of acronyms here, or a lot of whatever, code names of, of Jewish, Jewish alphabet soup on this page. But I put these here not just for a shopping list, but to give you a sense of what was going on with barely 70 to 100,000 Jews by the end of the First World War in the land of Israel. Two waves of immigration, the first religious, late 19th, early 20th century, the second socialist. And into this pot comes a very colorful figure named Aleph Dalit Gordon, A.D. Gordon, an Orthodox Jew who moves to Palestine Get this, when he's 48 years old, most of the other people there were late teens, early 20s. After his wife dies and he wanders around the country, he settles at the age of 63. 63, not a young man, in 19-whatever, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he espoused this notion of the religion of labor. He said that the land of Israel is acquired through labor, not through fire and not through blood. You had to actually redeem the Jewish soul by working the land of Israel. And this notion of, as the Hebrew song that the, the pioneers used to sing, Anu Banuarza, we came to the land, leave not Ulihibanot, to build and to be rebuilt as new people. Exiled from our land for 2,000 years, not allowed to farm, right? Not allowed to own land in Europe, a total different reality. 
And as he says, the Jewish people has been completely cut off from nature and imprisoned within walls for 2,000 years. It is labor which binds the people to its soil. How do you get rooted in the land of Israel? You have to work the land and to its national culture, which in its turn is its outgrowth, is an outgrowth of the people's toil and labor. We must create a new people. We are engaged in a creative endeavor, the like of which itself has not been found in the whole history of mankind. Visionary people and Gordon, not just like the precursors, and here's a picture of him. He was not a young man, ideological precursors. precursors. He comes to the land of Israel and he works with people who are his children's age, younger, maybe even his grandchildren's age, and they're in the most simple, austere tomb you could possibly imagine, in sharp contrast to those elaborate, you know, uh, cenotaphs that are put up in commemoration of the ideological precursors, the simple farm of Aleph Dalad Gordon, who really was the guru in many ways of this generation. And who is in this generation? You'll meet a couple of them in just a few minutes' time. It's this generation that endeavored to revolutionize the Jewish people, not do what most of our families were doing, mine included too, I didn't say this. All four of my grandparents came from Russia, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, and Russia, Poland, uh, that's four, um, to Canada in the 1920s. But the small group, 70,000, that comes to Palestine by the outbreak of the First World War wanted to create a new Jew based on these three components, self-defense, as I said, one of the organizations founded was the Shomer, which becomes the Haganah, which becomes the IDF. We need to defend ourselves. Jews were not allowed to take up arms to protect ourselves for 2,000 years of exile. The idea of Jewish labor, Aleph Dalit Gordon, the religion of labor, labor, physical labor, will help redeem you and connect you to the soil from which we have been alienated and distanced for 2,000 years. And as earlier as Ben Yehuda and Chaim Nachman Bialik said, we must speak a common language and have it produce a common culture. It's what our late poet Chaim Gori said, the holy trinity of Hebrew labor, Hebrew defense and self, uh, Hebrew defense and Hebrew language. And this caricature you might be familiar with of the typical Israeli, very informal, uh, open shirt, uh, kova temple, a fool's cap, um, open sandals, very laid back, revolutionized the notion of new Jew, which, to use the language of the other late great national poet, uh, Yehud Amichai, who was born in Germany and comes as a young man, he writes shortly before his death in 2000, when I speak of the formation of the new Jew, I am not thinking of the almost legendary Sabra, somebody born in Israel. Right? He and everybody else I've talked about were born abroad. The expression new Jew is far more profound and fundamental. My generation, young people who immigrated, laid the foundations for the new image of the Jew for that new Jewish framework that could absorb immigrants from distant cultures, including all kinds of religious zealots with or without flags. So this idea of people coming from overseas, from exile, and creating a whole new world for this Jew who would no longer be alienated from the land. And in many ways, this symbol, this picture, one of my original pictures of this group of people trying to cross the river Degania. When we drive along the shore of the Sea of Galilee today, there's a nice bridge and there's a dam there. But remember what this was like in the early 20th century. Here are some of the founders. You can see men and women alike, by the way, somewhat avant-garde in their proximity back in the early 20th century. Some of the founders of Degania Aleph in 1909. The only one you might recognize is this man over here, David Ben-Gurion. Here he is in Plonsk in Poland before he makes Aliyah. Where is he in the picture? I'll circle him for you just so you can see him because his hair looked a little bit different when he was a young man. He was all of, I think, 19 at this time, born in 1886, right? And in the Jewish Legion, he's beginning to look a little familiar, serving with the British in the First World War. He was part of this wave of Aliyah. It didn't work out too well as a farmer, by the way. He quickly went into the political realm and succeeded. Um, he wasn't a great farmer, the people who were with him at the time in, in uh, Sedger and other places. This is the first... Kibbutz, Kibbutz de Ganya. It's a museum today. This is what the building that they're standing on over here looks like in uh, as it's been preserved today. One of the more successful kibbutzim. There are still 270 kibbutzim and realize that before Israel was born, most of these kibbutzim were already in place. Again, some of the amazing pictures um, from 100 years ago, these people realized didn't have cell phones and didn't have email and 
pretty much when their late teens and early 20s decided to leave Eastern Europe, they came to this land where malaria um, was infested, where the temperature was totally different from what they were used to in the Pale of Settlement. They celebrated their harvests, um, looking with somewhat dour faces, although she looks a little bit happy over there, but totally going against the grain of the majority Jewish response, late 19th to early 20th century. Um, this notion of the new Jew, per, you can see the uh, maybe propaganda, let's say PR, images of the smiling, although it's pretty heavy what she's carrying on her shoulder, the bushels of oranges, of course, laying a new, uh, laying a, new uh, a trough down there for agriculture, and of course the joyous smiles of the chalutzim, the pioneers, really the embodiment of this notion of a new Jew, somebody who is no longer the object of someone else's history, but the subject of our own story. And as you see the JNF um, pictures, I think this is already from the 30s or 40s, right? We are a nation reborn on its ancestral soil. Look at the new Jew, very muscular. Look at this couple over here celebrating, uh, harvesting the wheat, but yet you notice the indigenous camels back here, the building of Tel Aviv in the 1930s in the Bauhaus style, and of course the harsh desert environment of much of the rest of the country. Um, and maybe your parents' generation remember this a little bit better, or grandparents, definitely in my case, um, of that period. 1906, not everybody who came here was socialist. And although the first kibbutz started in 1906, 1908, so too did the first Jewish city, not a village like Rishon Lezion, even though today it's a city, but a intentional city. 66 families meet around what is today Rothschild Boulevard and Herzl Street in Tel Aviv. And there they have this famous lottery, parceling off 66 sections of this land that was purchased. Now you can see where they had the most important building in town, the Gymnasia, the first Hebrew high school. And here is Herzl Boulevard, for example, and Rothschild Boulevard. And the first house, which is today, I think it's an art gallery or a real estate agent office, I don't know, opposite the Shalom Tower, is the house in the corner of Herzl and Achada Am Street. And there in the corner, there's a little sign, can't see it, but there's a picture of it, that says, this is the home of the initiator and the founder of Achuzat Bait, Akiva Arie Weiss. He'd been to a number of Zionist Congresses in Europe. He wanted to come and settle the land with his family, comes to Jaffa and has this idea of, let's buy land, sand out there, and we'll build a new Hebrew city. A lot of people thought it was crazy, but when you look at Tel Aviv, a city rapidly approaching half a million, population, a city that is the epicenter of Israel is the startup nation, the place, as I say, where my son and daughter-in-law chose to move just a few months ago, you can understand um, how amazingly successful one of this ideas of Zionism, of building a, new, a city that would normalize us, not just the farming in the, in, in the fields, but would normalize us amongst the nations. Perhaps the best kind of window, I think, into this period is this amazing painting, perhaps most famous in Israel by Reuven Reuven, Romanian born, who in 1923 paints this image, the first fruits. And you can see on the left, it's a triptych, it's an Israel museum, definitely see it if you, when you come to the Israel museum, the Bedouin shepherdess on the left, the Bedouin shepherd on the right, he's asleep, she's working hard, making sure the sheep don't go too far away. So the indigenous landscape with the cactus over here, you can see. And then you see two Jewish couples, the traditional old Jew, diaspora Jew, traditional religious Jew, this Yemenite couple, where they're holding up first fruits, which in Hebrew is Bikurim. That's one of our pilgrimage festivals in our annual cycle. They're holding up a pomegranate. That's their offering. But then on the right hand is this couple, new Jews. She with her breast exposed, he with like Atlas, with you know the entire world on his shoulders, larger than life, almost mythological proportions, right? Their first offerings are not just their meager one pomegranate, one of the seven species of the Bible, but it's this massive watermelon, this big bunch of bananas, and a huge cluster of oranges. None of these three fruits can be eaten by themselves, but are much more for the collective good. The new Jew, the old Jew, and the indigenous landscape. And Reuben describes the sunshine, the sea, the pioneers, their bronzed faces, this is them, and open shirts. The Yemenite girls, and children with enormous eyes, a new country, a new life was springing up all around me as he lived in this new city of Tel Aviv in the 1920s. An amazing image of kind of everything building up to this particular point. What's happening in the world? There's a war going on. The first war, the, the first world war, the great war. And in the midst of that war, it seems clear that the Ottoman Empire is no longer gonna exist. 
And so the great powers, France and Russia and Britain, and then Russia as a revolution in the fall of 1917, but France and Britain divide. They take this map, and A, area over here is going to be under French control, and B is going to be under British control, including Palestine down over here, Lebanon over there. Then there's an agreement in 1917 called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Again, this is the line. Everything kind of uh, green was going to be under the uh, in the French control, and everything here was going to be under British control. And without going into too much politics, essentially, um, it's the beginning of British control of much of what we call the state of Israel today, of Palestine back then. And we're not quite yet at the mandate. We'll be there in a few minutes. That's 1917. And in November of 1917, there is this very famous letter written by the uh, Lord uh, Balfour, the foreign secretary in His Majesty's government in England, that says that His Majesty's government in the UK views with favor the establishment of Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. It's the first time in 2000 years that the, anybody has said, we view the Jewish people have a right to a national home. It doesn't say a state. It also says, by the way, it being um, um, that it should not prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights of political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Revolutionary document. And Ben-Gurion says it best when he says, um, where am I over here? Uh, the British capture, capture, capture Jerusalem in 1917. Ben-Gurion says, only the Hebrew people, that's us, can transform this right into a tangible fact. Only they with body and soul, with their strength and capital, must build the Jewish national home and bring about their Jewish national redemption. So there's excitement in the Jewish world. Ben-Gurion is serving in the British army at the time, of course. 1918 land is purchased already. A year later, or a few months later, in you know, December 1917, the British captured Jerusalem. And two months later, land is purchased to build a university on Mount Scopus. And later that year, uh, sorry, two years later, in 1920, there is uncertainty still over who's going to control the land, and there is violence that begins up in the Galilee in 1920. Why? They're not 100% sure who controls what. And so the French and British send two engineers who walk from what is called Rosh Hanikrat today in the border with Lebanon over here, and they walk along this area, up along here, and they eventually say, come down to the southern part of the Golan Heights. And they say this area is going to be, first it's this area, but this is going to be the border between the French occupied area and the British occupied controlled area. Why? Because these three tributaries up here go into the Jordan River. You see where I'm moving around up over here, which then go to the Sea of Galilee. And whoever lives in, we call Israel today, needs the water from the Sea of Galilee. Otherwise, you can't exist. Whereas up in Lebanon and over Syria today, they have other sources of water, number one. Number two factor has to do with population. And up over here are four Jewish communities, including this town, Matula, founded in 1896. And one of those four towns is called Tel Chai. It wasn't really a town, it was a little fort at the time. And in this community lived a couple dozen people. And on the 1st of March, 1920, with the uncertainty of who's going to control what, there's some violence, and there is an attack. Eight of the Jewish defenders of this community, including this man over there, where is he? Sorry, uh, Joseph Trumpledor, are killed in this battle. There's the tomb to Trumpledor and the other seven defenders of Tel Chai. But what's most amazing about this battle on a very low ember, I mean, eight people killed is not insignificant, a few dozen people in the community. But it was the first time, really, that there was a connection between settlement and security in the land of Israel. There was a debate. Should, of the Jewish leadership in the small community in the country, should we send defenders there? Should we abandon the community? In the end, they decided to send defenders there and not abandon the community, which, as I said, even today, when we talk about settlements in the West Bank, Jewish communities in Judea, Samaria, that is the same context. More settlement, it's harder to move the borders. People who live there are a form of security. And Trumpledor, really one of the mythological stories of this period, up until the early decades of Israel, was Tovla Mut Ba'ad Arzenu. Supposedly said, as he was dying, um, and he was taken, he was evacuated, it's good to die for one's country. And this real story became an important um, moral, important myth, even though it was a true story, of course, in the early generations in Israel. In 1922, the British get a mandate from the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations for Palestine. Here it is. 
palace at the beginning. It's going to be what is today the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, this kind of brown area. By the 1920s, Jordan becomes a protectorate and then eventually becomes an independent monarchy. But the mandate, quote, will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home. Again, not a state, but the national home, whatever that means, we don't know. And the development of self-governing institutions, which, by the way, already existed. Remember the Teachers Union, 1903, HMO, 1911, way back then? And safeguard the civil and religious rights of all inhabitants of Palestine, irrespective of race and religion. So this is 1922. So we're going pretty fast forward. We've got more Jews coming into Palestine. There are two more waves of immigration. After the First World War, right? But at the end of the First World War, there were 60,000 Jews here. 10 times as many Arabs, but all of a sudden, in the early, in the years after the First World War, another 40,000 Jews moved to Palestine, largely socialist, on the hopes of this Balfour Declaration of 1917, and then the mandate of 1922. Tel Aviv, founded in 1906, grew. The communities, the agricultural collectivist communities grew, particularly in the Galilee and the Jezreel Valley. Organizations that I've already mentioned have, have grown, but in 1921 are the first Arab riots, protests over the growing, the growth in the Jewish community, not just in terms of numbers, but look at all the components that one needs of a successful society. So many of those components are already there. Another wave of immigration comes, 82,000 Jews by 1929, largely in response to anti-Semitism in Poland. And so before Hitler comes to power, there are now 175,000 Jews and 860,000 Arabs. So there was a growth of 260,000 Arabs in this period, 13 years, but relative to 600,000, it's you know not even 50%, whereas there's a trebling of Jewish population from 60 to 175,000 in that 13 year period. Um, another one of the, maybe I had too many, I'm gonna skip these guys, Burl Katz and Elson, we'll forget him, another founder of labor Zionism, um, I'm running out of time here. So there's Burl, a contemporary of Ben-Gurion. He dies too young, pre-state, pre he dies in 1944, but he really was a, 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 not just an ideologue, but he really was also a, a mover and shaker who founded lots of things from the newspaper to the HMO, really the, here's the HMO, 1911, Burl Katz Nelson founded. Um, and that, by the way, in, in bracket, why Israel is so well prepared to deal with vaccinations, because we have four HMOs. The first one goes back way over 100 years, and there is socialized medicine covering everybody within Israeli society. We had Arab riots in 1921. Another wave of Arab riots begin in 1929, um, largely over disagreements over prayers at the Kotel at the Western Wall. Huge numbers, 133 Jews killed, 116 Arabs killed, um, British police were killed as well, lots and lots of violence. But the tragedy, I think, to me was that when the British summon Jews and Arabs to kind of testify, to figure out what started this wave of violence, the commission concludes the following. The fundamental cause, without which in our opinion disturbances either would not occurred or would not have been a little more than a local riot, is the Arab feeling, get this, of animosity and hostility toward the Jews, consequent upon the disappointment of their political and national aspirations and fear for their economic future. They were concerned, the Arabs, that what was going to happen to what they saw as their land, what was going to happen to their economic future. Economically, we could argue it was much better having Zionism, but that's another story. The immediate cause of the outbreak were the long series of incidents connected with the Western Wall. These must be regarded as a whole, but the incident among them, etc. Next is importance to the activities. So there was a lot of anger in the Arab population in Palestine. Here we see Jews leaving the old city, the Jewish quarter. Here we see the damage in the city of Tzfat. You might remember those who've been there, uh, walking along the galleries and the old synagogues in the alley of Tzfat. But there's another wave of immigration in the late 1920s, largely from Germany after the ascent of Hitler. Um, so we had 175,000 Jews beforehand, and then we had another huge number, more than that, actually, two quarter of a million coming up until 1939. Unfortunately, the British closed down immigration in the 1930s, um, and that led to an illegal immigration that circumvented the finite number of legal immigrants the British were allowed. This already started in the 1937, uh, in, in 37, sorry, after another British commission of inquiry, after another wave of violence. By the late 1930s, 
We've got a Jewish community approaching half a million. We've got this massive growth in this white city of Tel Aviv. The city of Haifa is growing as well. Institutions are growing, the Philharmonic is there, and it is a different kettle of fish than we saw at the beginning of the 20th century. And so the Arab protest of 1936, the British Commission of Inquiry, the Peel Commission this time, comes up with the first idea of trying to partition Palestine. We'll create a Jewish state in orange, we'll create an Arab state in pink, and this green area from Jaffa up to Jerusalem and Bethlehem will be an international zone. The plan is never implemented, but um, it's discussed. It is only then final, kind of a little bit different on the map, developed in 1947 by the United Nations. This is the partition plan. Notice the yellow in the Galilee here, we call the West Bank, north and south of Jerusalem, yellow, and here Gaza, what is today Ashdod and Ashkelon, and a bit of the Negev Desert was going to be Arab, as well as the city of Jaffa, and all the green was going to be Jewish, based largely on who lived where. Much of the Jewish state was this Negev empty desert, which, Negev empty desert, not much going on inside of the desert. But it's interesting, this was the first idea, and the Zionist leadership debated this hotly, but by 1947, there is a formal United Nations plan and idea of trying to create a Jewish state. I'm going to end with my next slide, and then I'm going to turn it over to questions. Um, as I said, the Arab response was largely, I think, when we look at what was going on in, in, in not just in the Galilee and in the agricultural settlements, but just in this little area of what is today called, you might have been there, the, uh, the Namal, the port of Tel Aviv. All of this happening in about five years from 35 to 1940. Once the Arab leadership realized that it wasn't just about farms in the rural area, but every sector of economic and cultural life, this was not going backwards. This was an attempt, the Arabs saw, that the Jews were really going to have a full-on heavy presence in the land of Palestine, or Palestine as they called it. The first Maccabiah. International Jewish Sport Competition in 1932 takes place there. The second one in 36 with many great athletes who are not allowed to compete in the Berlin Olympics. The Levant Fair, this economic fair of hundreds of Jewish enterprises displaying their wares and Jews and people coming from Alexandria and Egypt to, uh, from, to Damascus to see what products are being made by the Jewish community in, in Palestine. The Philharmonic, the Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra, under Toscanini, he wasn't Jewish, but he fled Mussolini. And all these Jews who were no longer allowed to perform in Germany in particular, all of a sudden world-class musicians, a cultural institution, the Palestine precursor to the Israel Philharmonic is formed in this area. There is a port that is built. When Arab violence begins in 36, they close down Jewish business and immigration. And what happens? The Jews then have to build their own port which is still there. I mean, it's not a port today, but it is called the port, but that was built in, 19, in the late 1930s in response to the Arab closure of the port. Um, electric power station is built. Pinchas Rutenberg, one of the early Zionists, had this notion of building a power plant up in the, the Jordan River area and one in Tel Aviv. It's still there. And finally, an airport is built, which closed down just a few years ago, um, they're going to use it to develop new apartments, and Tel Aviv will probably go about 500,000 when they do that. But all of these things, when you think about it, give the Arabs in Palestine a sense that, hey, this Jewish community isn't going anywhere, and as such, this massive, massive wave of Arab violence continues. I'm looking at my clock. Rabbi, are you there? Pipe in if you are. Yeah. Oh, good. So I, what, I got how many more? I got a couple more. Should I go to Q&A now, and then we'll pick up on this next week? Sure, I think that's probably a good plan. Okay, so I'm going to end with the Arab Revolt. I'm going to catch my breath. Hopefully you guys can too. And shoot away with your questions, please. So friends, if you have questions, it's easiest for us to see them if you uh, raise your hand in Zoom, um, which is if you go to the reactions button, you'll see that there's a little icon where you can raise your hand. And then um, Mike can see you or I can see you and we'll call on you. Or Mike, you've just stunned everyone into silence with your incredible capturing of an immense amount of history. 
No, no, no. But hold on, somebody wrote something very interesting. Somebody wrote here, Susan wrote, one shekel in 1897 translates to 613 today. Interesting. Which there's something biblical about that, if that is the case. Yeah. Um, um, uh, wait, FYI, wait. Voting, in, voting in 22 WZO election cost the delegate seven and a half dollars. Interesting. So inflation hasn't, uh, but the assumption, I guess, is most delegates make other contributions. But yeah. And Mike, Rick Goldman has his hand up. Please. Hi, um, just a, a question that I don't want to take off topic, but maybe for future consideration, I find this topic fascinating, but also extremely troubling for Gentiles. It's a fascinating, you know, we all just assume that we are supposed to have this nation state, right, as Jews, but yet for non-Jews, it provides a question as for all of my non-Jewish friends have always questioned, how do you have it both ways, right? So I'm curious if we could maybe address that you know, because it draws, now it blurs a line between the pure religion, right, and something that it's no longer. And uh, I'm wondering what the feeling was like in the outside world looking at this movement, you know what I mean, as it was happening uh, as well, you know, because I think today it's even very troubling for Christians alike and anybody just to say, what is it? Like, I, as, a, as a religion, as a pure religion, you don't have a state, you don't have a government, you don't certainly have socialistic economic challenges and things like that. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always confronted with that question. What are you? You know, are, are you a nation? You know, or are, are you or are, are you a religion? And and I'm curious how the world was looking at it back then. And, 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 and you know, because for us, it's just was supposed to happen. But for the rest of the world, it's very confusing and troubling. And maybe for people on this call, it is as well. Well, thank you, because I think you you really hit it on the head, Rick, and that, what do I mean hit it on the head? The reason that I'm born in Canada and I'm living in Israel now is because, in a sense, of your question. I have always believed, and I will argue this ad nauseum, that Judaism is both a faith community and a people, and we're unique in the world, I think. Maybe the Armenians are both, but then there are Armenian Catholics and there are Armenian Christians, Armenian Orthodox, and there's a huge difference there. But what is unique about Judaism, and this is why I will defend Zionism, that we are the longest or the oldest indigenous, you know, uh, uh, written down indigenous population reclaiming our ancient land. So we're unique in the sense that we are a faith community and we are a people. And in fact, it goes back to the first Jew of choice in the Bible, right? When Ruth says to her mother-in-law, Naomi, in the book of Ruth, which we read every year in Shavuot, that when her husband dies, and her mother-in-law says, go back to, you know, you, you're a Moabite, go back to Moab and be, be, go back to your family. She says, no, 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 where you go, I go. Your people are my people, your God is my God. And that notion of Judaism, both being about the people of, 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 of Judaism and the God of Judaism and the land of Judaism, we are unique in the world. And it's very, very hard for Christians to understand that. Um, I could bore you with a whole lecture. I have a master's in Jewish Christian edu in Jewish Jewish Christian relations, and the program that I took a number of years ago in Cambridge, England, the premise of Jewish Christian relations, and there are a lot of faculties in North America that didn't exist a generation ago, by the way, in this field, is based on the two mid twentieth century massive events that significantly impacted on Jewish Christian relations. One is the Shoah, of course, and Christian culpability for that theologically. And the other is the creation of the state of Israel. How can Christianity deal with having a Jewish state when Christianity for 1900 years saw itself as triumphant and, and, and superseding Judaism? So it's very, very difficult. And I've spent a lot of time guiding a lot of Christians around Israel for them to get their head around this notion of a people that is both a faith community and a you know, the Judaism is both a faith community and a people. And I don't know how many of you, without because the rabbi's on the call, how many of you say, I'm not even sure I believe in God. You cannot, as a Christian, say I'm a devout Christian and don't believe that Jesus is the Christ Messiah who died on the cross for the sins of humanity. You cannot say I'm a Muslim and 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 don't believe that Muhammad, you know, surrendered and we have to, you know, surrender to through Muhammad to Allah. You can say I'm a proud Jew, but I don't believe in God, right? And I think. That's part of the answer to um, the question that your Christian friends have had. But I want to see, I see Ed has his hand and Rick as well. So whoever wants to go first, jump in. Ed had his hand up first, to be fair. Unmute yourself, Ed. Unmute. Unmute, Ed. Okay. You have to... I got it. 
Am I back? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for this great talk. Um, just kind of, you touched a little, you touched on the 1939 and the British shut down immigration to Palestine. And what was the impact of that as far as um, how many people did they turn away and what, I suppose, you know, from Europe and obviously they probably turned them back to Europe um, and to their demise in many cases. What was the impact of that and how much, you know, how, how different would Israel have been if that, uh, if they were allowed to uh, immigrate to Israel at that time? Well, good question again. We don't know exactly how many would have come here. And again, two and a half million Jews went from the Pale of Settlement to North America in the same time that 70,000 Jews went to Palestine. So going to Palestine was a minority response. And nobody could have known in Europe, I think, what eventually happened in 1939 to 1945. But by 1939, when the war begins, there is, obviously it's hard to move anywhere, you know, in, in Europe and across the Mediterranean. But between... 45 and 48, there is this wave of illegal immigration, which 100,000 Jews immigrate illegally to Palestine, kind of circumventing that British limitation of 1,500 Jews a month. We'll see that next week. That's about two or three slides down, down the way. So there was this attempt of illegal immigration. And, and in places like Poland, for example, and we'll see this next week as well, uh, there's huge exodus once Israel is born. 1948 to 1951, there are hundreds of thousands of Jews Holocaust survivors mostly who flee Europe and come to this independent Palestine. So I don't know how many would have been able to get here during the war anyway. And I don't know how many Jews would have left Berlin even in 1933. Had you have even told them that if you don't leave in 1933 and 1943, 10 years from now, you're going to be put on a train from Gleis 17 and you're going to be sent to a place called Auschwitz and you're going to be you know, killed in, in a gas chamber. You wouldn't have believed that in 1933. And most German Jews did not. So again, even when they had the opportunity to leave Germany from 33 to 39, half of the Jews who were in Germany did, a quarter of a million of half a million, and many came to Palestine, but many looked for many other places to go because they didn't necessarily think and buy into this idea of a Jewish homeland. Rick, I see your hand. Um, that means, oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, in tracing some of the writers and ideological uh, forebears of, of Israel, um, you did not discuss uh, Bar Ilan and, and Rav Cook on the religious Zionist side, and you didn't discuss Jabotinsky on the revisionist side. To some degree, my understanding of Israel today is the socialism of many of the people you did talk to has largely collapsed, although it's left behind the institutions that you talked about. But what's ascendant in Israel is more the ideological descendants of Jabotinsky and the ideological descendants of bar -Ilan and of Cook and so on. So could you spend a little bit of time talking about those, those other two ideological um, former uh, foundations of Israel today? Sure. Well, I would, I would argue for, thank you for the question, Rick. I would suggest though that the, and this is where I, where I was coming from in terms of not only my own personal bias, but in putting this presentation together, that most of the foundations pre-1948 were created by socialists. That doesn't mean that there wasn't the stream of cultural Zionism. It doesn't mean there wasn't a stream of religious Zionism. It doesn't mean there was a stream of liberal Zionism, called it revisionist, but revisionist doesn't really isn't is isn't a good term in my eyes because revisionist is kind of against the mainstream but there were different streams and you'll see next week i'll talk about the incident of the altalena for example i'll talk next week about the uh, tension over forming different jewish undergrounds forming into the israel defense forces um, and as i said a few minutes ago that the political hegemony the political control was under the socialist leadership really up until 1977. So later on, I'll, I'll, I'll talk in not, not next week, I think the week after more about the ascent of the political right in Israel. But there's no question and you'll see this in the 1970s, the growth of the settlement movement in Judea Samaria, the West Bank, also largely by the Mizrahi movement or the heirs to the Rav Kook and the Rabbi Mohilever and many other and Barilan and many other religious rabbis. Um, but my argument is that the crux or the kind of center on so many levels, political, economic, cultural, etc., was from those that founding generation. You know, what I call the Mayflower generation of Israel, 
doesn't mean there weren't other generations, but the Mayflower generation of Israel were those socialists who really came in the decade leading up to the First World War. And we'll see in the next five sessions the influence of the other groups. Of course, there's a huge influence, and we'll see this in, 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 in later sessions, of the Mizrahi, the Sephardic immigration that comes to Palestine, which I didn't even talk about you know, in my first sessions. There was a Jewish community in Palestine pre 1880. They were mostly Mizrahim, they're mostly Sephardim, they were mostly religious. They were here, they were part of what's called the old Yishuv. But again, my my primary focus of this revolution of Zionism and kind of the avant-garde of this movement was the socialist Zionist. But you'll see in the later weeks, and keep me on my toes, Rick, to stick to my promise that I'll be touching upon the other Zionist dreams as well. Wonderful. Mike, thank you so much. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, we have gone over by 10 minutes and I imagine that will not be unique um, <laughs> for the next uh, five sessions that remain. I'll just put out there, like, please know that if you have, you know, if you are in a situation where you really have to sign off at one, it's no problem. Um, but my guess is let's expect that we'll, we'll hang out a few minutes after each session for uh, time for questions. We want to make sure that Mike gets his opportunity to, to teach us um, all of the content that we've asked him to in this short period of time. Um, so to all of you, thank you, Mike. You have final words? Yeah, well, thank you, Rabbi. But um, by the notion, by the sense of your questions, I will tell you that this is six sessions. I originally planned this as four sessions. Audacious and stupid, maybe I was. But originally four sessions, I could easily stretch this into a lot more than that. Um, and as I said, I make choices along the way. And you'll see in starting the next session, there's certain events that I talk more about and other events that I talk less about. It's totally subjective. If you look behind me on my bookshelf of History of Israel, you've got the Martin Gilbert version and you've got the Danny Gordas version and you're getting the Mike Hollander version. So agree or disagree that these are the, 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 the important or the main events in the development of Zionism and history. But that's what this conversation is. And the other thing I want to add is, I know the time is uh, suggests that this particular group of people are going to be tuning in. Um, but my challenge is, and maybe this is more for the rabbi, is how do we translate this into your children or grandchildren's having a conversation with them? A, are they going to find the time to have six sessions with Mike or someone else? But that, I think, is the big challenge. So I look yeah. forward to seeing you all next week. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, friends, for joining us wherever you are. We hope you are well and wish you a happy new year. Look forward to being with you soon. Uh, good evening, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone else. We'll see you soon. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Tadaraba. Kasha.